tonight. Venezuela decides. Nicolas Maduro declared the winner of Venezuela's presidential election with mounting calls from the opposition on foul play. Fighting back. Israel vows retaliation following lethal strikes by Hezbollah. The escalating tension only adding to mounting fears of a full-blown conflict. 100 days to go. The road to the White House sees a neck-and-neck -neck race between Trump and Harris, their campaigns fighting against the clock to pull ahead of the other. And the legend returns. Celine Dion blows away spectators with her iconic performance at the Paris Olympics opening ceremony, coming back stronger than ever. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening. You're joining us on World News Tonight at the start of a new week. Thank you very much for tuning in. We have lots of updates to key stories that have developed over the weekend to bring to you today, starting off with the elections in Venezuela. Nicolas Maduro was declared the winner of Venezuela's presidential election on Sunday, but the opposition and key regional neighbors immediately rejected the official results. The opposition coalition itself claimed victory by a large margin after an election campaign tainted by claims of political intimidation and fears of fraud, and following predictions by pollsters that Maduro would lose but was unlikely to concede after more than a decade in power. Both sides of Venezuela's Sunday election claimed victory in the early hours of Monday morning, in a vote that saw accusations of underhanded tactics and reports of isolated incidents of violence. The country's electoral authority announced just after midnight that Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro had won a third term with 51 percent of the vote, despite multiple exit polls pointing to an opposition win. Maduro then declared victory at the presidential palace in the capital, Caracas. Soy Nicolás Maduro Moro, presidente reelecto de la República Bolivariana de Venezuela. The election authority said that with over 80 percent of ballot boxes counted, opposition rival Edmundo González won 44 percent of the vote. They added that results had been delayed because of a, quote, aggression against the electoral data transmission system. Meanwhile, opposition leader Maria Corina Machado claimed González had won in a landslide with 70 percent of the vote. González, a 74-year-old ex-diplomat known for his calm demeanor, made no concessions to Maduro in later remarks, but made clear that he was not calling for supporters to take to the streets or commit any acts of violence. The opposition alleges that the election authority, which is meant to be an independent body, acts as an arm of the government. Their call for Maduro contradicts multiple exit polls, including one from Edison Research predicting that Gonzalez would win 65 percent of the vote, while Maduro would win 31. Another from Meganalysis predicted a 65 percent vote for Gonzalez and just under 14 percent for Maduro. We applaud the Venezuelan people. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, speaking from Tokyo, called for a detailed breakdown of votes. In his victory speech, Maduro railed against foreign interference. When Donald Trump denounced that he had the election stolen, we didn't meddle with that. We didn't tell them to do this or do that. This is in their hands, an internal affair the United States will solve. Machado, the opposition leader, also called on the country's military on X to uphold the results of the vote, saying, quote, It is time to put yourselves on the right side of history. You have a chance, and it's now. Venezuela's military has always supported Maduro, a 61-year-old former bus driver and foreign minister. There were no public signs that leaders of the armed forces were breaking from the government.
Typhoon Gami swept through central China's Hunan province, bringing record high precipitation to the county level city of Zijing. Two meteorological stations in Zijing recorded 487.5 millimeters of rainfall in 12 hours on Saturday morning and 670 millimeters within 24 hours, respectively, setting new records for the highest rainfall in the province. To ensure the safety of the dam and protect the lives and property of people, Sijing's Dongcheng Reservoir released flood water at a high rate of 2,500 cubic meters per second on Saturday. Twelve towns in Chenzhou, a prefecture-level city above Sijing, were without telecommunications and 16 without electricity. Villagers in Chenzhou were trapped in their houses and some were swept away by the flooding river, but fortunately all were rescued. On Sunday, the provincial capital Changsha issued a red alert for heavy rainfall, the highest level in China's four-tier rain warning system. It also raised the flood response from level 4 to level 3. Severe road flooding in several areas of Changsha has been significantly disrupting transportation. The Israeli military has conducted airstrikes targeting Hezbollah's military in Lebanon. The airstrikes come in response to an alleged attack by the militant group on a football pitch in Golan Heights that killed 12 Israeli children and teenagers. Thousands of mourners joined a funeral procession on Sunday for 12 children who were killed in a rocket attack on the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights. It marks the single deadliest attack in Israel or Israeli annexed territory since Hamas's assault sparked the Gaza war on October 7th. And it is fueling fears of significant escalation between Israel and Hezbollah militants in Lebanon. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant said he visited the town of Majd al-Shams early on Sunday, describing the site of the attack as, quote, a place where innocent girls and boys were murdered during a soccer game. He vowed to retaliate against Hezbollah for the strike. Hezbollah initially announced it fired rockets at Israeli military sites in the Golan Heights, but denied involvement in the attack on Majd al-Shams. There is no justification for terrorism, period. And every uh, indication is that indeed the rockets were uh, from, uh, or the rocket was from Hezbollah. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Tokyo said Israel had the right to defend itself, but he said Washington also did not want to see further escalation in violence. We don't want to see it spread. That has been uh, one of our goals from day one, from, uh, from October 7th on. Majd al-Shams is a Druze village. The Druze are an Arab minority who practice a form of Islam and make up more than half of the 40,000-strong population of the Golan Heights, territory captured from Syria by Israel in the 1967 Middle East War and annexed in a move not recognized by most countries. Israeli and Hezbollah fighters in southern Lebanon have been exchanging fire for months, but appeared to be avoiding an escalation that could lead to all-out war. Saturday's strike threatened to tip the standoff into a more dangerous phase, and United Nations officials urged maximum restraint from both sides. The conflict has forced tens of thousands of people in both Lebanon and Israel to leave their homes. The joint meeting of senior officials from Israel, Qatar, Egypt and the United States to negotiate a ceasefire in Gaza adjourned early, several hours after it began in Rome, with no apparent progress reported. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office said in a statement that Mossad Director David Barney had returned from his meeting with a mediator in Rome and the negotiations were expected to resume in the coming days. At the meeting, the officials discussed an Israeli document with clarification regarding the draft agreement that was conveyed from Israel. According to the Israeli newspaper Hartiers, in the document, Israel toughens its position demanding the addition of checkpoints along strategic roads between southern and northern Gaza and control of an area along the Gaza-Egypt border. The meeting was part of an effort to reach a ceasefire deal in which more than 100 hostages held by Hamas in Gaza would be exchanged for hundreds of Palestinians jailed by Israel under a three-stage plan that has been discussed since late May. And over in the Korean Peninsula, to more systematically counter the provocations coming from the north, defense chiefs of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan put their heads together in Tokyo over the weekend and sealed their first security cooperation memorandum. 
Defense Minister Shinon Shig met with U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and Japanese Defense Minister Minoru Kihara in Tokyo on Sunday and signed a memorandum that institutionalizes trilateral security cooperation amid growing threats posed by North Korea. The Memorandum of Cooperation on the Trilateral Security Cooperation Framework aims to formalize high-level defense talks, information sharing, and trilateral exercises to contribute to peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula and in the Indo-Pacific region. The multi-domain trilateral exercise Freedom Edge will likely take place more often. In the meeting, the three defense chiefs recalled their commitment to strengthening their cooperation to deter nuclear and missile threats posed by North Korea. They also expressed serious concerns about the regime's growing military cooperation with Russia. In a separate bilateral meeting with the U.S., both sides strongly urged North Korea to stop sending waste-carrying balloons toward the south and condemned military cooperation between Pyongyang and Moscow. In a meeting with the Japanese defense minister, they agreed to establish an annual plan for defense exchanges and restart joint search and rescue exercises. The three defense chiefs agreed to hold the next meeting in South Korea next year. Let's take a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. And on the road to the White House tonight, in 100 days, the United States will set a name on the country's top job. Like recent polls indicate, experts say it's going to be a very tight race, where both Donald Trump and Kamala Harris will push themselves in this 100-day sprint to the election. Tonight, both campaigns in high gear with no time to waste. Election day just 100 days away. Vice President Kamala Harris has only been a presidential candidate for seven days. But her favorability rating has grown by eight points to 43 percent. Now potential running mates jockeying to join the Harris ticket, blitzing the campaign trail and Sunday shows. From billionaire Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker, an heir to the Hyatt hotel chain, to Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg out defending Harris. Harris celebrating a groundswell of support, claiming her campaign has raised $200 million in this last week since Biden dropped out and endorsed her. In battleground states, people have been flooding our offices around the country to volunteer. Former President Trump saying he's done with any idea of toning down the rhetoric after that assassination attempt. We have a brand new victim. And honestly, she's a radical left lunatic. Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, beloved by unions and also rumored to be a top VP contender for Harris, unfazed, arguing Republicans say every Democrat is too liberal. Trump's running mate, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, today dismissing the scrutiny that he's faced for past comments that he made about not liking Trump. Still in the U.S., firefighters were struggling to fight the Park Fire in Northern California after the blaze more than doubled in size in 24 hours, overtaking the Durkee Fire in Oregon as the largest active wildfire in the U.S. The Park Fire had scorched more than 350,000 acres, about 90 miles north of state capital Sacramento, as of Saturday evening, according to the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. More than 130 structures have been destroyed, with evacuation orders and warnings issued for communities in several counties. It was only 10 percent contained so far, authorities said, but cooler temperatures and more humid air were expected in the region, potentially helping efforts to slow the spread of the fire. A man was arrested on Thursday on suspicion that he started the park fire by pushing a burning car into a bone-dry gully the day before. The size of the blaze has now overtaken Oregon's Durkee Fire, which was the country's largest active wildfire. The Durkee Fire has scorched nearly 290,000 acres in the state's east. It was set off by lightning on July 17th, with high winds fanning flames across brush, timberland and ranches. It's among 45 large fires burning across Oregon, according to the state's forestry department on Friday. 
Meanwhile, the U.S. Forest Service said a firefighter has died after a single-engine tanker crashed near the Falls Fire in southeastern Oregon. And now some updates on the Paris Olympics now. U.S. star power was in full effect at the Games. LeBron James led the Redream team to an emphatic win over Serbia and Simone Biles fought through calf pain in a triumphant return to Olympic gymnastics. And today, Rafael Nadal and Novak Djokovic are playing after the Spaniard won on his return to tennis singles action. The duo has a combined 44 Grand Slam titles between them. Here's a look into what's being played out at in the Games. A huge moment at this year's Games is underway in the men's single tennis tournament. Two of the greatest players of all time, Rafael Nadal and Novak Djokovic, are facing each other in the second round at court Philippe Cartier. The triathlon training swim has been cancelled for a second day due to poor water quality levels in the River Seine. On Saturday, data showed a huge increase in E. coli compared to the previous two days. But organizers say the race will go ahead. Meanwhile, much is expected of the U.S. women's basketball team at this year's Olympics as it bids to win an eighth consecutive gold medal. The squad's campaign gets underway against Japan. We saw a 14-year-old win gold in women's street stakeboarding final yesterday and it's now over to the men. The men's street stakeboarding finals is underway and defending Olympic champion Yuto Horigome is one to watch out for. With the men's team gymnastics final is set to begin, the US will be looking to win its first team medal in the event since 2008. Malaysia has sent Russia an application to join BRICS. This was stated by Malaysian Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim on X. He noted that the country's intention to join the association was the main topic of his meeting with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. And for more details on this, we have with us other there in the world news special correspondent Nevanmi Ranasinghe from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. What do you have for us, Nevanmi? Thank you, Anuradi. The head of the Russian Foreign Ministry visited Malaysia for the first time since 2015. Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim had said in an interview with Chinese media that Malaysia will soon begin the official process of joining the BRICS. During his visit to Malaysia, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov also held talks with his counterpart Mohammed Hassan. The Russian minister invited Mr. Hassan to Russia. The ministers also exchanged notes on the establishment of cooperation between the Foreign Ministry's Diplomatic Academy and the Malaysian Foreign Ministry's Institute of Diplomacy and International Relations. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the world news special correspondent Neva Mirana Singer from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Before we leave you tonight, an icon that is revered world over has finally returned to her rightful place in the spotlight. Celine